This is PFTOT, our little extra show that we do after PFT Live goes off the air every weekday. Chris Sims still hanging around with me against his will. This is, see, this is what you get, Chris, when you sign on full time. We make you, we make you do more. You used to be able to run out the door after the show. Now you have to hang around. But today, I have to give you credit. You had a great thought while we were talking about Russell Wilson's appearance on Jimmy Fallon, The Tonight Show, when this question just kind of curiously came up about him having the best contract in NFL history. That felt like a plant to you, and I think you may be right. I feel like maybe Russell Wilson is trying to send the Seahawks a message that now is the time to make him the highest paid player in the NFL, not one year, two years, three years from now. Yeah, right. He wants to get it going, get it going now. I mean, Seattle, if they're smart, they'd get it going now too just to, you know, hey, shave off a few million dollars per year on the contract instead of what Russell Wilson going out in 2019 and oh once again having one of the best seasons out of any quarterback in football that's what he's done just about every year here in recent history so the price number is only going to go up especially if the team continues to improve like it did last year and looks like it's going to so uh, I think from those re- those th- that standpoint it makes a lot of sense but yes I mean as I understand anything like that usually somebody for Jimmy Fallon comes in and talks to the the hand or the agent, whoever's there with Russell Wilson, they talk about facts or things that are going on in the life. And I just think it's probably one of those things where his agent was like, well, yeah, and you know, hey, there's a chance Russell could be the highest paid quarter player in the history of the NFL. And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. That sounds like a good question. We'll write that down. Just seemed like it was the setup all along. Yeah, and, and really – We know that that title is temporary. You're only going to be the highest paid player in football for a year or two, maybe if you're lucky three. And if it's Russell Wilson now superseding Aaron Rodgers, he's going to hold that title probably until Patrick Mahomes does his next contract. But still, you, you get a chance to at least be for some window of time the highest paid player in the history of the NFL. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means you've got a great contract. And I think the Seahawks would be smart to get him to 33.6 million per year superseding Aaron Rodgers 33.5 million per year now because it's only going to get more expensive and Chris think about this let's say he would play it out let's say he would go franchise tag 2020 franchise tag 2021 the Seahawks let him hit the market in 2022 instead of paying 52 million what do you think he makes per year on the open market oh my gosh I I would think somebody yeah somebody signs him to oh we're desperate we need a guy like this to come into our organization and jumpstart everything I mean I mean, at that point, I don't even know what it would be. Forty million a year, probably, right? Something along those lines. Uh, with three years down the road, I would think that's going to be top quarterback tier type of money. Maybe more than forty million. I mean, we've right. never seen anything like that. And yes, he'll be thirty-three at the time. But for quarterbacks, it doesn't matter. Right. If anything, you get better as you get older. As long as you still have your physical skills, you are at the point where your brain has developed through all the reps, everything you've seen, everything you've studied to the point where the game slows down even more. The game is easier. And if he still has his uncanny physical skills as the game slows down even more, he's going to be even more effective as he gets older. There's this weird sense, though, Chris, that he's that he's overrated, that he's not as good as people think, that he can't do it all like a Tom Brady or an Aaron Rodgers can do. I I think he can do it all and I I think the fact that he stays healthy that he's mobile that he gets out of the pocket he throws on the run he throws accurately he can kill you with his legs if he has to I think he's underrated if anything I I agree I I think he is phenomenal he is without question one of the three best quarterbacks in football I mean his all-time quarterback rating and not that I hold everything true to stats but there is some truth to stats he's second all-time in the all-time quarterback rating I mean he's almost a three full points above number three which is Drew Brees that's how special uh, Russell Wilson has been all they've done is win since he's been there Um, they've been to two Super Bowls won one of them I mean if you're talking about rewarding guys for acting appropriately and and being leaders in the face of your franchise damn nobody fits that mold better than Russell Wilson I mean he's just been Mr. Model Citizen so much of a model citizen and such a good guy that it actually is seems like it annoys people and especially in Seattle 
Seattle. Like he's a goody two shoes, which I understand. He comes out that way, comes off that way a little bit. Go Hawks or a little political, but he doesn't give a damn. He's up. He's with you know upstanding is what. What do I want to say? Is his image as a player, as a person, it's it's flawless, and uh, I think he needs to be rewarded for that a little bit too. Yeah, some of the guys that used to be on the Seahawks would mock him behind his back right. with the Go Hawks thing. They do it in a high pitched voice, and and that you know, and that's the thing. It was kind of a rough and tumble crowd, and then Russell Wilson comes in, and they viewed him as management, yes. not as one of them. Right. And they've always had that resentment. That's why they're reshaping the roster with him as the centerpiece of the team. Well, you know what? If that's what you're doing, you better pay the centerpiece accordingly. That's right. Now it was Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson entered the draft in 2012, was a third-round pick by the Seahawks. The Dolphins could have had him at number eight. I know that's got to hurt Miami Dolphins fans, but Ryan Tannehill out in Miami after having every opportunity to prove that he could be a franchise quarterback. The Tennessee Titans pick him up. They'll pay him $2 million this year. The Dolphins are paying the extra $5 million. The Titans give up a fourth-round pick next year. They get a six from the Dolphins this year in exchange for a seven this year. A good deal for the Titans. Titans who desperately need a backup quarterback to Marcus Mariota. When this was announced on Friday, Chris, John Robinson, the GM of the Titans, said that Tannehill is there to help, to push, and to compete with Marcus Mariota. Right. Could Tannehill actually beat out Marcus Mariota? I, I do think he could, yes. I mean, uh, first of all, I think it was a great signing by the Tennessee Titans. It makes a lot of sense. Tannehill has a very similar skill set to Mariota. If Mariota does go down and he is the starter, okay, Tannehill can come in and they don't have to change anything as far as their offensive philosophy. They're both not natural quarterbacks, in, in my opinion or my evaluation. They're more athletes who play quarterback instead of quarterbacks who are good athletes. And people might go, well, who are quarterbacks who are good athletes? I would go, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, uh, Patrick Mahomes. Those are guys who are have all the quarterback intangibles, uh, but yet have athletic ability that we don't see a whole lot at the quarterback position. These guys have the all the uh, intangibles of a great athlete. They're fast. They got good size, straight ahead speed, acceleration, all that. But some of the quarterback stuff lacks a time, whether it's precision passing, decision making or and staying healthy has been a big issue. But, Mike, to your original question, yes, I think Ryan Tannehill is every bit as good as Marcus Mariota, has the same issue Mariota does of staying healthy. But I would give him the notch above Mariota as far as just a passer in the pocket. And I think that could be interesting if they let, let really let them compete uh, in August. Yeah, and here's the thing. They've got more than $20 million this year tied up in Mariota, and sometimes that salary exactly. cap number, that financial commitment, mm -hmm. helps break the tie, yes. right? But, but hey, if Mariota gets injured, here's, here's what could happen. Mariota gets injured. Tannehill comes in and plays. He plays well. Right. That's when we would hear that Mariota will be back when he's 100%. And he'll be 100% when the Titans decide he's 100%. He'll be 100% when Ryan Tannehill either gets injured or is no longer as effective as he was. But Tannehill, when healthy, is not a bad quarterback. The problem is he's been injured too much. He's been through a lot of different systems. But Adam Gase eventually got a lot out of him in 2016. Then came that low hit from Calais Campbell, and that derailed things for Ryan Tannehill. Yes. Okay, Cam Newton had his season derailed last year by a shoulder injury that kept him from throwing the ball down the field. He's had surgery. All indications are he'll be healthy for 2019, but also he has decided to change his diet. He's gone vegan, and he wants to get down to 235. Chris, I don't know that a guy who already takes a lot of physical abuse wants to make himself smaller. If anything, you'd want to have a thicker coat of armor. And and look, I know Tom Brady does the avocado ice cream, and there are other quarterbacks that watch their diet, but anytime I hear vegan, I think, oh, that's one of the reasons Colin Kaepernick isn't in the NFL. Of course, we know that's baloney, which definitely isn't vegan. But what do you think about Cam Newton deciding to clean up his diet and lose weight? Well, you make good points about him being bigger and physical and more strong because he plays the position differently than most quarterbacks, certainly different than Tom Brady. They don't ask Tom Brady to take you know shotgun snaps and ram it through the middle of the line of scrimmage on third and two like Cam Newton and expect him to break tackles of a middle linebacker. Now, I think the biggest thing for a guy like Cam Newton is the weight and size is probably starting to weigh 
on him, no pun intended. And the fact where, you know, when you are a big human being like that and you're constantly cutting and running and sticking your leg in the ground to, you know, make a move on a guy, it starts to wear out your joints, your knees, your hips. So I think that's probably where he's looking to take a little weight off is just to stay fast still, to feel good when he does move around. But your point about staying bigger, like I don't want him to lose muscle. I'm all for vegan. I'm all for climate change. You know that. The number one issue to climate change in our world is our obsessive nature with red meat. Yes, nothing contributes more to climate change than red meat. So I love you're that not he's doing getting that. Out. You're not getting out. So, you're not getting out of the steak you owe me. No, don't, I know. Don't That's try. Fine. And I, I eat steak as well. I'm not trying to say I'm 100% vegan, but I try to live by those vegan rules a little bit. Okay? And I always get a little worried when I hear about a football player taking all meat, all red meat. I just want to be like, be like 66% vegan and then just have like a steak or a hamburger at night, whatever it may be. But I think he'll find the right formula to get it all done. A little <laughs> vegan. He's a, you're, you're part, you're vegan. I'm light 66% vegan. That's how I am. Mike. I try to go two, three, <laughs> two thirds of my meals. I try to go vegan on a daily basis. Cam Newton is listed as 245. Who knows what he actually weighs? But yeah. my concern would be you get down to 235, you can't take the pounding. And already already they, they don't throw the flags because they see this guy who's a giant right. among his his competitors, and they think, ah, they bounce right off of him. He's fine. But yep. uh, the, the key is the shoulder's got to be fine. He's got to transition to a guy who is less mobile and more of a pocket passer if he wants to play deep into his 30s. The Dallas Cowboys believe they have the nucleus for a team that can contend for years to come. The problem is they have to pay them. And Stephen Jones, the Cowboys COO, said recently that the team needs to be super creative when it comes to how they're going to pay these guys. And he's right. Demarcus Lawrence, second year of the franchise tag, $20 million. He wants a long-term deal. Amari Cooper, he's due to make over $13 million this year in the final year of his rookie contract. He's going to want big money. You've got Dak Prescott that they want to pay. Ezekiel Elliott wants to get paid. Byron Jones is due for a deal. How in the world do you pull all, all of this off and still have enough money left to have a roster, to have depth, to have guys who can come in and play when starters get, get injured? That's the biggest problem that superstar teams have, Chris. You've got all your money tied up in a handful of guys, and you have to hope that an undrafted rookie can be pressed into service and you can coach him up to not become the weak link in the chain when your defense is getting shredded because they keep picking on this guy out of – you know, uh, Southern Mississippi that yeah. not, not nothing against Southern yeah. Mississippi could be out of West Virginia too. I'm just picking, you know, some yeah, guy that know. they just pick up right. off the street who can't play. Right. No, I, I know. Yes. They're, they're going to have to juggle things around. I mean, you know, the, it doesn't look like they've, uh, you know, orchestrated the salary cap to uh, its best capacity the last few years. That's put them in some tough spots here, but either way, you know, yes. I mean, when you talk about all the money they got to throw out there, I, you know, Omari Cooper, I got to think they got to think let's let's watch him a little bit more this year. I know it was an awesome end of the year last year and everything he did, but you know the two years before that in Oakland were not very good. So I think there's probably still a little bit of a buyer beware sense there. You know, Dak Prescott, I think they're probably very close to going, no, he's the guy, he's the leader of our team. And I would tell you the first half of the year last year, I didn't think he was, but he proved to me down the stretch he was. Ezekiel Elliott. Like, they know that one. Why don't they just start getting that done right now? Like, get it uh, get it going in, like, Todd Gurleyville, like the Rams did. Uh, d you know he's your running back. He know you're, he's the centerpiece of your offense and what you, you really formulate everything around. You know, give him a contract that's a little bit better than Todd Gurley. Get it out of the way so you can move on to the next headache they got to figure out. Uh, but they certainly have some, some issues to deal with, and, and it's going to be interesting to see if they can keep all these guys. I almost feel like with Ezekiel Elliott, they're just going to run him into the ground, maybe so? franchise tag him once, and then and then just and then go draft somebody else. Yeah. I, I just feel like he's not going to be a guy that they're going to pay a ton of money to because the risk is too great on the team. Once you give a great running back a market value contract, and this Todd Gurley arthritis, I think it affected what Le'Veon Bell got, right. and it may make the Cowboys more determined to not pay Ezekiel Elliott. Well, yeah, I mean, hey, listen, if they if we went into like Ezekiel Elliott and we gave him the the Chris Sims, Mike Florio pep talk, what would we tell him? 
I'd tell them don't play football this year. Start holding out for money right now. You've led the NFL in rushing two out of the last three years. You're without question one of the three or four best running backs in football. And to what you're saying, he runs like a, you know, a freight train. I mean, it's car crash after a car crash after a car crash. I would not think his career lasts forever. And we and I, you and I all talk about this all the time. The beating running backs take is just, it's brutal. So if I'm Ezekiel Elliott in this camp right now, I'm going, uh, no, I think we should start getting the uh, contract negotiations going right now. You're not going to just wear me out and crush me for nothing for the next two years. Chris, I'll tell you what, uh, you need to save some of these great points for later in the week. We got more shows to do, but the idea of Elliott holding out, it reminds me of Emmett Smith, 1993. Remember that? They had just won the Super Bowl. Yep. Smith wanted more. They started 0-2. He had held out two regular season games. He came back. They became the first team that started 0-2 to win a Super Bowl, all yep. because Jerry Jones eventually blinked and paid Emmett Smith. Lesson to Ezekiel Elliott and his agent Rocky Arsenault. Maybe the time has come to draw a line in the sand and say, I want my mine or I am not showing up. Yes. All right. Speaking of players and agents and trying to get your best possible deal. Look, I, something happened yesterday between Richard Sherman and me, and I think I understand why it happened. Although I think Richard needs to take a look at the bigger picture. I'm not going to bore you with the details here, Chris, but there was a meeting last Monday between roughly 60 players and six agents in conjunction with the NFLPA's annual meetings, and they're trying to get ready for a potential work stoppage in 2020 or 2021 and whatever they need to do to plan for it. And they brought the agents in to give them kind of a voice in the process because they felt like they were shut out the last time around. And the bottom line is, I've heard from multiple people, it, it just didn't go well. There was hostility. There was acrimony. There, there was some resentment there. And one of the guys at the middle of it is Richard Sherman because he doesn't like the fact that the agents are saying bad things about his decision to represent himself and the bad deal he did while representing himself last year. So after the dust settles, the union sends out this lengthy memo characterizing what happened at the meeting. And it's clear from that memo it didn't go well. So I wrote a story yesterday at ProFootballTalk.com about that memo and I had Richard Sherman attacking me for essentially fake news. The memo makes it clear it was a hostile and contentious meeting. And there are divides that must be repaired between players and agents before everyone can come together and take on their greater foe, the owners. And my point is, as long as the agents and the players are fighting, the owners just sit back and smile because that means they're going to win when the time comes to do the next CBA. So I'm not going to get into the whole back and forth. I don't appreciate some of the things Richard tweeted. I think he was telling something other than the truth. I think he's, I think he's got a bias against me because I was the one who said most loudly in the media yes. that he did a bad deal. Right. But I'm also the one in the media who says the most loudly that the players have rights and I've supported player rights for years now. And I've been at the forefront of using the franchise tag to your advantage, getting better protection from concussions everything and I'm against the draft yeah. because I think players coming into the league should be able to pick their teams. Well, I, nobody else out there is against the draft. So anyway, I, I don't, I don't need to recite every position I have on every issue that favors the players, but pretty much every issue where my position comes down, it favors the players. Yes. It's just on this specific issue. Richard's decided to, to pick a fight. And uh, Chris, you know me well enough to know I'm not going to start the fight necessarily, but I ain't going to, I ain't going to, uh, I'm not going to turn the other cheek if someone takes a swing at it. Hey, Mike, you are, you keep it real. And uh, I really respect you for that. It's not always fun. You don't want to fill out brackets for the NCAA tournament. You could be killer of fun, whatever it is. But you are, Am I allowed to give you the finger on this? <laughs> You're allowed to. I think so. This is digital, they, right? They Just blur go it out. Yeah. Uh, they, but blur either it out way, anyway. you do. You don't sugarcoat, and that's what I respect about you. Even when it's an unpopular opinion, or oh man, even I might know this guy, but I know these facts, and I gotta say it the way they are. And I know this guy that I know in the NFL might not like me for it. You never back down. I give you a ton of credit for that. That's why you're hated and loved in the industry. And then at the same time, to your point to defending you with Richard Sherman I, you're you're one of the biggest vocal supporters of players rights players getting more money the hell with the billion dollar owners they have enough money as is so I will always defend you in those departments man because uh, I sit here and witness it four days a week unfortunately I got to deal with you too but it's true to, you're as true as can be when it comes to that um, and on the subject that's what but here's yeah, what stunned me about it 
I'm not the guy you want to fight, Richard. I'm the guy that you want to try to find a way to get along with. And don't fight me over something that you're wrong about because it was a hostile meeting. It was a contentious meeting. Don't try to act like it was something other than what it was. And it was the union, Chris, that prepared the memo that was sent out to all the agents explaining what a hostile and contentious meeting it was. That's what just blew me away when he decides to pick a fight over something that he is factually wrong about. Yeah, well, Mike, I mean, I think you said it and I think you know again this happens as a player you know you just you take things personally sometimes and he I'm sure read your articles when he signed his contract last year coming off a free agency from the Seattle Seahawks and just didn't appreciate it I think that's more or less probably what it is more than anything uh, is just that you kind of called out some of the things you didn't like about the contract you're a pretty smart guy and are very good in those conversations and uh, I think that's probably a little bit of this as well all right. Uh, b- before we have to make this PFT OT OT, we probably should wrap it up. We've taken up enough of your time. Chris, you can go back to your little office, wherever, whatever. It's just so weird that you're here full time now. This I'm is here. week three already. It's weird. I can't get used to it. And we're, I'm going to be. Uh, d- do you know that on Thursday, I'm going to be there? And apparently, you and I are doing Chris Sim un- unbuttoned together. Oh, are yes. you aware of it's that? It's going to be role reversal, too. This? It's my show. I'm hosting. You're going to have to listen to me. And then I'm going to make the conversation. So this is going to be fun. I'm going to have a lot of fun turning that around. So basically, I will just like ruin the experience for you like you do for me four days right. a week. And then that's, that's going to be my just, role. And, and then I'll take your role where I get the last word on everything that's said so I can get done with the segment and always feel good. That's what you do to me. So it's going to be a great role reversal. I like this. But see, I've learned that on the segments we have where there's a hard out, you know to keep talking right up until the last three seconds, so I can't say anything. You figured that out. It took you a year and a half, but you finally figured it out. I finally figured it out. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah, they call it a filibusting. That's what I know. When you have a good argument, I try to uh, shut you up by talking to the very end. (laughs) All right, well, we'll shut up for now. Thanks, as always, for your support of everything that we do. New Chris Sims Unbutton coming up later today. I'll probably do a PFT PM later today. Although I really, I, I, I'm going to say I really don't want to get into this Richard Sherman thing, but I have a feeling I'll end up talking about that. Plus anything else that may be happening in the NFL. Have a great day. We'll see you on Tuesday for another brand new edition of PFT Live. See ya. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.